First and foremost, I do want to extend my deepest thanks to Thomas Moore for affording me this opportunity to speak to this group today. And um, I also, the sponsors, I always like to take an opportunity to thank them as well because we couldn't put these things on without the sponsors. And I wanna thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and be part of this event today. <clears throat> I am Alicia Webb Edgington, but before I embark on this PowerPoint and this journey we're about to take, I want all of you to give me a little grace here and let me tell you why. When you start looking at this, you're going to be like, <coughs> Alicia, could you not keep a job? <laughs> um, but I promise in the next half hour-ish, I will land this plane and it will all make sense to you. <clears throat> I was recently in a presentation where a gentleman stated three principles. Practice rigorous authenticity. Surrender the outcome and do uncomfortable work. Well, I've always been known to be authentic. Probably a little too much sometimes. A good portion of my career I've done uncomfortable work. But I've not always been good, sisters, at surrendering the outcome. I wanted to be in control, envision the future, and how could I make it perfect? And this is just not how life is. So let's go on this journey together. And while I'm up here talking about my career, I want you to think about where you are and how you can incorporate the aforementioned three principles that I just gave you into your life. Yes, I am a retired Kentucky State Trooper. I always get a few weird looks uh, when I tell people that. And that feat was made possible only in 1990 when the Kentucky General Assembly did away with the height requirement for women in the state police. <laughs> so prior to 1990, women had to be five, seven and a half. And clearly you can see I am not five, seven and a half. <clears throat> but what an adventure and full disclosure, you know, taking on five foot two woman was not exactly uh, what the Kentucky State Police was ready for. But nonetheless, I survived. <laughs> now, you never know the impact that you're making on your children. So occasionally I would get to come home during shift and grab a sandwich or something. And, you know, I would take my radio off and my flashlight and my hat. And <clears throat> so this is a picture of Jill that, um, much to her chagrin, that I'm using today. But just always remember, you never know the impact that you're having on people, whether it is your children or other people. And there's more to this story here in just a minute. I had the honor of becoming the first woman in the Commonwealth to be appointed as the Homeland Security Director. And what an honor and privilege that was for me to have had that opportunity afforded to me. But both of these challenges that I had in my career helped me to break down barriers and defy expectations. I want to tell you just a little story, and I really felt so badly for this gentleman, but I had just been appointed Homeland Director, and we were having an event in Washington, D.C., where all the Homeland Directors were convening to talk about emergency response. And it was just weeks before Katrina. So we're all in this room, and it was set up very much like the National Governors, Governors Association does, the squares around the table and we're all listed by states. And so I'd gotten there early because I wanted to make certain I wasn't tardy. And I go in and I set my stuff down behind Kentucky. 
And this gentleman, lieutenant colonel in the military, walks over and he says, hello, I'm so-and-so. He said, um, ma'am, the support staff will be sitting along the wall. And I shook his hand. I said, I'm, I'm the Homeland Security Director in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. My name's Alicia Webb Edgington. It's very nice to meet you. And he stood there and he looked at me and he said, shall I chew on my shoe or yours? <laughs> and I said, it's okay. I said, I suspect I'm about to be one of maybe three women in the room. And he was deeply apologetic, but you know, sometimes we just have to give folks a little bit of grace. So as I was going along as the Homeland Director under Governor Fletcher, all of us that's been in political appointed jobs know there's an end to those things. And you get fired. Well, that happened. And I was licking my wounds and I got approached the very afternoon that I had left my office. I got approached first by Congressman Davis. He said, we want you to run for the 63rd district for the Kentucky House. I said, you gotta be kidding me. And he said, no, I said, Congressman, I'm a retired state trooper. I've written people tickets, I've locked people up. I said, nobody's gonna vote for me. <laughs> and he said, we think they will. So 28 days later, and I, you know, you're like, what? It was a special election. John Droud had just been appointed Commissioner of Education. And so I really didn't have any time to think about the what ifs. I just had been fired, so I was like, what have I got to lose? I have no job, let's see what happens. So 28 days later, I'm being sworn in as the state representative for the 63rd district, and I'm proud to say Thomas Moore was in that district. So I spent five years in the Kentucky General Assembly, and then I was approached by Congressman Davis in 2012. He said, Alicia, we want you to run for Congress. And I thought, oh my gosh, run for Congress? Washington, D.C.? What? And so I talked to my family about it, and my husband said, if you want to do this, let's do it. He said, but promise me one thing. <laughs> He said, if you don't prevail, he said, can we close this chapter? <laughs> and I said, well, sure, because, you know, I was like, I'm going to win this thing. Well, as you all know, that's not exactly how that turned out. And I lost that election in 2012. I came in second to our current setting congressman, Thomas Massey. And the day after that election, I got to tell you, I was just sitting there going, oh my gosh, what just happened? Because I felt like a complete and total failure. But what I could not see then, I see now, that that loss, it put me on the trajectory to where I am today. So in some of the events in your life when you feel like you've failed, it's a journey and there's something greater than what you could have ever imagined. So you gotta roll with it. Everything is going to work out. Now maybe not like you wanted it to or in your mind that you thought was perfect Remember I told you, I'm very hard at surrendering the outcome. So I turned the page and I promised, as I promised my husband and my daughter, I said, we're going to close that chapter, no more politics. But I didn't have a job. And I thought, I've got to go to work. I mean, the Edgingtons are not independently wealthy. <laughs> and so 
um, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, and I get a call from some gentleman that I'd worked with at the state police. We had embarked, when I was at the state police, to go from a very paper-laden group to nearly zero paper. Everything from our crime report, citations, so on and so forth. And the group that had helped us do that was APRIS. And APRIS is a company based in Louisville, and most of you would know them from their system called VINE, Victim Information and Notification Every Day. That's a system that's used for domestic violence victims so that they will know when their perpetrator is in jail or out of jail. And out of nowhere, these guys called me and said, hey, you just got fired, you just lost your election. They were really being funny. They thought they were cracking themselves up. <laughs> we want you to come to work. I said, what? I said, what could I do for you guys? They're like, Alicia, seriously? You know our systems better than we do. We want you to be our government affairs and development officer for the law enforcement division. I was like, oh my gosh, really? I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> so. I went to work for APRIS <clears throat> and traveled all over the United States representing them in different legislatures across the United States doing this work. And I loved it because these are systems that help keep people safe. And then in 2015, my dad died. And that loss was so jarring. But, I mean, everything that I knew about politics and about my time in the state police, my dad went to military school. I was like, you know, there's more for me to do. There's more for me to do. And again, out of nowhere, I get a call from an old friend that was in Washington, D.C. And she said, Alicia, we're looking for a senior police advisor in the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement for the U.S. Department of State. Again, me being me, I said, that's a thing? <laughs> really? So I talked to my husband yet again. Ted's all about adventure. We'll talk about him in a minute. I said, Ted, I'd really like to take this job, but it's in Washington, D.C. And by that time, Jill was already in college at Center. And he said, Alicia, you do what you want to do. I said, okay, I'll have to fly home on Fridays, and then I have to leave Monday morning. He's like, it'll be fine. So here I go. And I went to the State Department, and I guess it's a good thing that I didn't find the State Department before then, before 2016, because I loved that job. I loved everything about it. I was assigned the portfolio of old Yugoslavia and North Africa, working on drug trafficking, human trafficking, and rule of law in post-conflict countries. And I loved the culture. I loved studying the religion before we would go in country and just looking and having the opportunity to meet people that had suffered, that were living in post-conflict countries and trying to reestablish rule of law and getting their lives back on track. And it was so fascinating to me. And then, how many of you in this room know Bill Butler? Well, I thought I'd see a few hands raised over here. Well, in 2016, on Thanksgiving weekend, I received a call, and first from Karen Finan, who's one of my dear friends, and then a follow-up call from Mr. Butler. 
And I'd known Mr. Butler at that time over nearly 30 years. I'd met him in my law enforcement career when I was on the security detail for Governor Patton. And Mr. Butler said, Alicia, I've got this place down in Covington. I want you to come see. And I said, okay, what is it? He said, it's Life Learning Center. I said, well, what do you do at Life Learning Center? Well, you're gonna, I want you to come down. You're going to take a tour. You're going to see. And as we all know, we do not say no to Bill Butler, correct? <laughs> and in 2016, I had just turned 50. Now, folks, most of the time, by the time you get to 50, you will have figured out what you want to do with your life, right? Remember what I told you? I'm going to land this plane, I swear. Well, we're nearly making the approach, okay, to land it. But now, I am probably, well, not probably, I know better than that. I'm in the most meaningful chapter of my journey that I've ever been in as the Chief Executive Officer at Life Learning Center. And for those of you that haven't been to Life Learning Center, we are an organization, we're a nonprofit that's located in Covington, Kentucky, but we empower the at-risk population with holistic approach for education and care that they need to succeed to get back in the workforce. It was absolutely a full circle moment for me. Now think about where this thing started. A law enforcement career, and for a good portion of my career, full disclosure, I worked narcotics. I worked undercover narcotics, mostly east of 75, but I did do a significant amount of work here in Northern Kentucky. I locked a lot of people up. But I knew in doing that, that many of those folks were not going to be one essence different than the moment we put them in jail. Now, please do not mistake what I'm saying here. I am not a person that is soft on crime. We live in a democracy and we respect the rule of law in the United States of America. But the concept of locking people up and throwing away the key is not an acceptable way to do things. And in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, we have the highest incarceration rate per capita than any other state in the nation. Now think about that. And for every one of you taxpayers, that costs you over $70 a day to keep someone incarcerated. Now, don't, don't mistake that individuals that have committed heinous acts, they are incarcerated, period, the end of story. But individuals that have suffered substance use disorder and have continued to advance their substance use disorder with low-level property crimes and drug possession, there's a better way. So you can't really see all of Life Learning Center. That's why I want you all to come down and visit with us. I want every Every person in this room has an open invitation to come to Life Learning Center and take a tour if you've not been there. And I've got Remy and Laura uh, here today and they can help choreograph that. <clears throat> but better than listen to me, I want you all to watch a video of one of our graduates. How do I make it play? Just.
that's okay. Trust me, you all do not want me to sing <laughs> for entertainment purposes. I want to give a quick update on James. So he did get his children back. And um, he is currently a facilities coordinator at Corporex. In addition to that, he's also uh, has his own construction company. And he just stopped by, he stops by Life Learning Center frequently. And he said, Miss Alicia, he said, in 2023, he said, I made over $100,000. Now, you think we can't make a difference? Absolutely, we can. And his three children are at Holy Cross. And he prepays their tuition annually. So to say that we're proud of James is an understatement. Because James was one of those individuals that historically law enforcement would have referenced as a frequent flyer. And he would tell you that. You heard him. I want to take a moment and tell you if you can see Jack's little story about Jack. She's another one of our graduates and she works for us at Life Learning Center now. <clears throat> Jack's at nine years old was basically raising herself. Her mother was a dancer in Newport slept most of the day, and so Jax would be the first to tell you 
she would take her mom's car, she would drink, smoke cigarettes, do lines of coke. She said, I was off to the races at 14. And Jack spent a lifetime in and out of foster care. And then at 19, Jax was involved in a robbery and Jax was convicted of a serious felony. So then when she got out of the penitentiary, she said, I honestly was like, my life's over. I'll manage to get some sort of a job maybe and keep going, but what have I really got to look forward to? And then Jax found heroin. And I was talking to Jax just a few days ago. I wanted to ask her if I could tell her story here. <clears throat> and she said, Miss Alicia, she goes, I'd done all kinds of drugs. She said, but never in my life. She said, when I did heroin for the first time, she said, I knew. Oh my gosh, this, this is a game changer and not in a good way. And so then Jax started nearly a decade of circling the drain. Jax heard about us while she was in detention from one of our other peer supports. Jax came to Life Learning Center and the first few weeks there, just as many do, she just thought all of it was hokey. And Blanche, you've heard them say it over and over. I'm fine. I know how to live life. I don't need you people telling me how to live life. I know how to do it. And occasionally our folks will have to say, I would beg to differ because if you did, you probably wouldn't be sitting here facing felonies that will stretch from here to Ludlow. And then Jax, she said, I don't know what happened, but something clicked. And that's what we generally hear. About week six, something clicks. I would like to think that it's divine intervention. <clears throat> that they really open their hearts and minds up to the three tenets that I just spoke of earlier. Authenticity, surrender the outcome, do hard work. Jax is now an education and employment coordinator at Life Learning Center, a peer support specialist. She has the highest retention rates of any of our other education and employment coordinators in the building because she takes away every excuse when people say, you just don't know what I'm going through. She's like, oh, 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 hold up. Don't, you better talk to the hand here because the face is not listening. I've heard her say it. <laughs> so with all of that said, my journey underscores a universal truth that the transformative potential inherent in every person, place, and, cir and circumstance. It is a testament to the belief that change is not only possible, but ladies and gentlemen, it's inevitable. And every individual and situation has the capacity to evolve. Through my experiences, I've witnessed firsthand the remarkable resilience of the human spirit and the profound impact of unwavering determination. It is a reminder that no matter where we find ourselves, we possess the power to affect positive change and shape our destination for the better. I want to tell one more anecdote about something that happened when I was a young state trooper. I was going along 68, I was working Harrison County, and I was a really good ticket writer back then. 
And I'm at this raggedy vehicle coming towards me and I clocked it and it was well above 55 miles an hour. I don't remember exactly, but I mean, it was, as we like to say, it was a good one. <laughs> and I spun around and I chased him down and I wrote him a ticket. That's what I did, just, and I said, you better slow that thing down on these two lane roads. I really gave him a talking to. Fast forward, I don't know, maybe a month, I can't remember exactly, <clears throat> Post gives me a call to do a welfare check on a child with a social worker from Harrison County, Susan Malone, one of my good friends. And the welfare check was about the child having a pair of broken glasses. And that her glasses were taped together and that the family wouldn't buy her new glasses. So I was like, Okay, so I go pick Susan up, and we go out to this house. And the house was older, but it was neat around it. And when I pull in, I thought, wow, that car looks familiar. But you know. So I go up, stay please. This lady comes to the door, and I mean, she's like, she said, yes, ma'am. I said, hi, I'm, at that time, I was Alicia Webb. I said, I'm Trooper Webb. This is Susan Malone with Social Services. I said, we're here to do a welfare check. And this lady was nice, neat, clean, I mean, but clearly all living in poverty. And I thought, why are we doing a welfare check? These people are fine, this is crazy. So we, she welcomed us in and there's, children walking all around and there's the child and she's got the little glasses on and they're taped up and um, she said what in the world you know well I said well and Susan explained I, I told her what we were doing there and then Susan explained the report and she looked at us and she goes we, we we're going to buy her new glasses matter of fact we were going to buy them last month but my husband got a speeding ticket Well, Susan had no idea that I was the one that had written the ticket. And I thought, Lord, if you'll just let me get out of this house, <laughs> I promise you, I will find the money to get that child a new pair of glasses because lesson learned, because I was dying. I got out in that car and I looked at Susan and I said, she goes, what is wrong with you? I said, I was the one that wrote the ticket. And she goes, well, I hope you're proud of yourself. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not. And I said, I'm going to figure out what to do. <clears throat> so I called home. You remember that guy that I showed you a few minutes ago? I called home and I said, Dad, I said, because at that time, state police, we were making $19,500 a year. And I said, Dad, can I borrow... I don't know, whatever, $100 or 150 because I mean, I clearly didn't have it. I said, I swear I'll pay you back. He's like, well, yeah, what do you want? And I told him the story, and he's like, Alicia, he said, you should ask some more questions. And I thought, you're exactly right. And so from that point forward, when it came to writing tickets, sister, I asked more questions. And I said, where are you headed and why are you driving like you are? But those are the kinds of things that teach you very valuable lessons. And they're the ones that my dad always used to say, a bought lesson is the best lesson. And I bought that one. So I want each and every one of you to take a moment to reflect on what truly ignites your passion. What drives you to get out of the bed in the morning with a sense of purpose and determination? Whatever that is, 
Folks, that's your calling. And your calling is not merely a personal pursuit, but rather it is deeply intertwined with the concept of service. When you discover what ignites your passion, you uncover the foundation upon which your service to others is built. Your calling is the unique way in which you contribute to the greater good, using your talents and your skills and your passions to make a positive impact on the world around you whether it's through volunteering, advocacy, or dedicating your career to a cause you believe in. Your calling is your opportunity to serve others and create meaningful change in the world. Service is not just a noble endeavor. It is the very essence of your calling. It's the manifestation of your deepest desires to make a difference and leave a lasting legacy of compassion, empathy, and selflessness. As you're embarking on your journey to fulfill your calling, remember that service is not only a privilege but it is our responsibility. And it is one that has the power to transform lives, uplift communities, and create a more equitable and just world for all. So you remember the three tenets that I spoke of when I first started talking. Practice rigorous authenticity. Surrender the outcome and do uncomfortable work. I didn't know where those three tenets came from. And I was speaking to one of the peer support specialists, a good friend of mine. And he said, Alicia, he said, those are the three basic tenets of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, if CEOs across the country would use those three tenets to run their companies? He said, wouldn't we be in a better place? I was like, wow. So I'm going to end this to let you see a picture of the most understanding husband in the history of the world. <laughs> We've been together 35 years, and uh, Ted is the director of school safety for the diocese now, so you all will see him most of the time up at Covington Catholic. Um, but I can't say enough about the support that he and Jill have given me, because as you've seen through this journey, I could not have done half of this without them supporting me in these endeavors. So all of my work, I, I can't even, there's no way to show the gratitude to my husband and daughter. And this last picture is a little bit of the shameless plug for Reese Across America. <clears throat> and if you have not participated in that, Jill got us involved in that this year. And what a privilege to be able to go and put Reese on the graves at Arlington Cemetery. And it's so rewarding. So that's my shameless plug for the day. Um, and what an honor it has been for me to be your keynote speaker. Again, open invitation to Life Learning Center. And please, all of those that I had just meeting for the first time, I'd love to know more about each of you in this room. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>